pleasure to be here today. My name is Jerry Bertoldo. Um, I was asked to put this presentation on after a chapter member heard me speak, which is basically the same presentation at the New York Central System Historical Society Convention uh, last June 2nd, 2019. So he came up to me after the presentation and asked if I'd do this again for the chapter. And I said, sure. Nothing like having something in the bag that you don't have to uh, spend hours putting together. So I hope you will enjoy it today. Um, dark navy blue blazer, no vest, and charcoal gray slacks. Uh, if you look at more conventional outfits that date back to the teens and the 20s, and even later years, B&O, Northern Pacific, C&O, and such, they had more like what I have on here. A blue blazer, gray slacks, and a cream or white uh, vest. And such. So this this is pretty old fashioned. So I, I put this together. I was in the tourist railroad business for 25, 26 years. It was Cuyahoga Central. We were on the uh, old Lehigh Auburn uh, branch for a number of years, moved to Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, and ceased operation or sold it in 2007 or 2008. Always had a fascination with, with dining car service. Um, I forget, that's uh, CNJ, Communipaw Terminal, back in the early 60s. Uh, always had a fascination with dining car uh, workings. We had dining car service on Pennsylvania Central, and used to play around with the diners and had a great time. So, Very good. So, uh, actually, Rich Stoving, who was, uh, had been president of the New York Central uh, Society's historical group, and was one of my partners in uh, Tioga Central in the Wellsboro days, uh, had asked me to do this presentation. So uh, I thought about it, and I said, sure, I'll tackle it. You never realize how long it's going to take you to do the research on these things until you get So I tried to do a pretty good job. My, one of my greatest challenges was to keep this to 45 minutes for the, for the Central <clears throat> Convention. Uh, I don't have a limitation today, but I really haven't added too much to it. As you see there, you've got a mercury pattern table setting uh, that came, this came from uh, John Fowler's Silver in the Diner book, actually. Great book. I talked to him personally last year when I was doing this. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation, a wonderful book. Uh, some acknowledgments here. Jeff Dowdy, who's written a lot of uh, books on your accessible passenger equipment, including dining car stuff, talked to him on the phone, it was helpful. John Fowler with the uh, Silver and the Diner, Jim Ball, who I think you folks know. Uh, Len Gordy, uh, collector, uh, New York Central fan from down in New Jersey. Uh, Sheldon Lustig, who's a trustee for the New York Central System Historical Society, it was very helpful. I went out to Middleburg Heights to the archives to dig through and get a bunch of information. Uh, Noel Whitterfield is, uh, was helpful out there as well. Everett Stover, my old friend and partner from the railroad. So here's my disclaimers and credentials. Um, I never rode a New York Central train in my life. I grew up in Staten Island, New York. On a clear day, we could see the Empire State Building. But I had no one in my family who knew much about trains, like trains. If it hadn't been for my grandmother living in the town of Newdorf on the Staten Island Rapid Transit, a B&O subsidiary, uh, I really wouldn't have had much contact at all until I went to college. Then a fellow whose dad had bought a railroad station, then I went home on vacations. I used to ride all over the place on commuter trains and try to pick up on what I missed on all those years. So I really don't own a lot of dining car things. Uh, I have a few. I'm going to bring some stuff today, but uh, I just I did not. Uh, I haven't written a book, done any articles, so I'm not a published person. Uh, I'm primarily an hours of service operating person. I've had a engineer's license since 1984. Uh, I'm a veterinarian by trade, a railroad uh, uh, person by, by hobby, I guess you put it that way. So I have about a 23-year hobby career with uh, Central, like I said, North Pennsylvania. We have about 21 seasons of dining car and cafe service. So I've got my, my feet wet and my appetite uh, taken care of with that. Uh, I have volunteered now for 11 seasons on the Adirondack Scenic. Not much going on there. I've been lucky enough to play around with their two business cars over the years. 
and catering and trips and such like that. Real fun. Love it. So what am I going to cover today? Well, this is going to have a, a lot of different parts to it. I'm going to do a, a, a brief history of dining on rails, challenges to dining car service that the road has faced uh, all these years, what types uh, of food service cars there were, particularly on Central. Uh, let's talk about the Mercury uh, and, uh, and beyond. Mercury was pretty much instrumental in setting the stage for the Streamline era. Uh, the 1938 uh, century, etc. So, what did dining car service look like on the Central? A little on China and silver, waiters they poured. Uh, not, not too much there, a little more on silver than, than China for sure. Uh, what was for dinner? Talking about menus, service changes over time. Uh, the boom to bust numbers that led the railroads, and particularly the Central, to decide to get out of that business. Uh, what do we know about the workings? The dining car department internal, and Jim Ball is going to help you with this. That's the last section. He wasn't there in, in uh, the central uh, meeting to help me out, but he's going to do that today. So his section will be insights from the last storekeeper in Buffalo. You weren't a commissary chief, you were a storekeeper if you were in charge of supplying uh, dining cars, lounge cars, that sort of thing. So in the beginning, crude setups started in the 1850s. They turned sleeping cars, baggage cars, into makeshift restaurants. So you, you take down the beds and you would push the luggage off to the side and have stoves in there and cook and there'd be smells and odors and smoke and all that sort of thing. So these hotel cars within the sleepers, uh, they probably work a little bit better than baggage cars. In 1868, George Pullman came up with the Delmonico, which was really designed to produce food, prepare it in a kitchen, and have dedicated seating. And, uh, it was such a success that it remained in service till 1898 when it was actually wrecked. That's the reason they quit using that car. Uh, in 1867, there was actually a dedicated diner that was uh, built in Canada. So. In some ways, they beat us. Uh, Pullman dining service. We don't think of Pullman being in the sit-down, plated, full diner world. Uh, they, they only remained in that to 1905. They were smart enough to realize that they could not standardize dining car service across the entire nation that they served with sleeping cars. And they decided they would stay in the, the buffet, cafe, smaller venue food service, but they gave up the full service uh, 36, 48 seat diners at that time. Uh, Michigan Central, the, the, uh, the New York Central World, uh, operated their own diners in 1875. Uh, think about the New York Central was big with the Wagner car company until 1899 when Pullman bought them out. The New York Central didn't do very much with Pullman anymore than they had to before that time. Uh, New York Central Harlem Hudson River began operating uh, their own uh, Wagner diners in 1883. So they weren't the first on the block, but uh, pretty close. Food service has always been a challenge on the railroads. You think about it. Provisioning. Where and when do you put it on? How do you, how do you supply your commissary? Where does it come from? Who do you contract with? A limited storage and prep space. I haven't been in a number of diners and such and worked in them and such. They're very cramped. I mean, you don't have very much floor space at all. It's amazing where everything's stashed in them. Early days of refrigeration, certainly a problem. You don't want to poison people with meat and fish that's two, three days away from being cold and such. They did have ice refrigeration way back when the diner started, and it was certainly part of it until mechanical refrigeration came in the uh, 1900s, 19, the teens, 20, actually 20s, before that they came about on the cars. Where do you find a competent staff to serve food reliably and efficiently? Uh, servicing en route, think about hygiene and sanitation. Way back when, there wasn't health departments that came and inspected these cars. So uh, if you want a good reputation with your clients, you can send them half of them home sick, you cleaned up, but other than that, there wasn't, wasn't anything driving you there. 
uh, ventilation was big until mechanical ventilation really came about. Uh, uh, the odors and the smoke uh, and that sort of thing were, were problematic. Uh, breakage and thefts, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, was a big issue. And it was a loss leader really from the start. Uh, there was times in history during wartime and some other companies like the New Haven that actually turned profit uh, even in the 60s. Uh, the dining car service it was really based more on alcohol than it was on food. You really want to know the down dirty. Here's a slide I just added in this morning. Uh, didn't have a really good picture of a passenger train crew. This is not New York Central. This is uh, from the uh, April 24th, 1966 combined system timetable for CNO BNO. But if you think about this, I, I looked at this picture and, this, uh, and tried to figure this out. I thought this was like two crews put together. I don't think so. I think this is the Capital Limited. That diner in the background, that 1092, uh, 1092 was actually sold to the B&O to two twin unit diners sold them in 1958. It originally came from the C&O back in the early 50s. So if you look at that, look at the, look at the list of who was on, on this, this train, the crew. Well, I was trying to figure it out. I think the management might be a, I think that might be a guess on my part, but I think that is all one crew. And that's a light dining car crew with two cooks and three waiters. Most of these trains in the, in the heyday were four in the kitchen and four to six out in the diner. So, so there you have something like 18 people. So, and labor was huge cost to the railroads, particularly after World War II. Uh, this, I colored this in on the computer. It was a system map that I picked up somewhere. And I thought about it, and I went through a bunch of timetables and such, and uh, 1954 to be exact, and I colored these in. So the key to this is red is passenger service that had real uh, dining car service on it. I'm not talking about like a snack car, just something you could pick up, chips and pop, and that sort of thing. This was sit-down dining service. Yellow was actually passenger service that did not have uh, any food service on it, like the West Shore out here up to Mackinac City in Michigan up there. And blue was a color that I put in that indicated passenger service that was not on the system map. Like out here where you've got the, uh, the Falls Road, you've got the Auburn Road, St. Lawrence Division, uh, Adirondack Division. I did overlay some of that in red that actually had some sort of food service on it, like the, uh, the Harlem Division going up to Chatham and North Adams and up to Lake Placid. Actually had, uh, had a minimal amount of food service, but it did have something that was scheduled uh, in the late 40s, early 50s. So. In the New York Central world, um, until they got to be into the 60s when they were running, trying to get the deficits down, the Central was kind of a plain Jane operation. They didn't have lunch counter cars. Uh, they didn't have some of these uh, just simple walk-up counter things, the equivalent of Amtrak today. They, they had a limited number of, of food service cars. But when we talk about uh, full service diners, uh, start out with the straight diner. That was either a 30, 32 to a 48 seat car it has self-contained kitchen pantry in it. That's a classic diner. Uh, in, in the uh, post-war era, the twin unit diners became quite popular, although the Mercury train actually, when they rebuilt those in Beach Grove in 35, those were twin unit diners that they, they built out of unit cars. I'll show you some pictures of that. So these twin unit full diners uh, operated with a car that had the kitchen in it and had a lounge at, at one end or sleeping accommodation dormitory for the, for the crew uh, at, the, at the other. So these the, the, the table car, if you will, sat anywhere from 64 to 68 people. All it was was, a, was tables and chairs. There wasn't much uh, in there. Uh, the dormitory cars explained that one already. Uh, there were twin unit kitchen lounge cars uh, as well. 
they utilize probably the kitchen to a degree, but they had their own serving area for light snacks and, um, and drinks. Uh, a little bit confusing is the use of grilled uh, in the idea of a diner. Uh, in New York Central lingo, a grilled diner was not something that was a kind of sat at a counter and they had a broiler in the background and such. The grill was a uh, terminology used for a less expensive section of a 36 or 48 seat diner. Uh, it was usually closer to the kitchen. And in the New York Central, they put those with uh, uh, the seating was parallel to the window. You sat with your back to the window, so the tables were in front of you. That was the grill section. Now, the Adirondack Scenic. That donated uh, was 463, right, Central 463. That was a what built grill diner. Uh, well, the configuration now would <laughs> nothing like it originally was built as. So that was a less expensive uh, fare. Uh, the facing seats to, toward the aisle actually allowed the waiters a little bit more flexibility in getting around because uh, they, uh, with the table really close together, it was kind of tough for these guys to pass each other and such, so this grill section allowed them to actually pass a little bit easier. The diner lounge was a car with a limited number of tables on one end, acted like regular diner, a little, little less uh, of a menu selection. On the end, uh, other end of the car was a lounge with uh, drinks and uh, light snacks and that sort of thing. The buffet lounge or cavern lounge. Usually, this is what you think of the Hickory Creek, Sandy Creek, uh, Battling Brook, and those kind of cars. That uh, uh, They actually offered at your seat beverage service. Nothing too heavy duty as far as anything to eat, uh, but they had little sections where you had little tables and chairs clustered together. It was very nice to uh, talk with, with two, three, four people together. This one here is a really strange thing. I have no idea what this car looked like. In the 1948 system timetable, it says it was a restaurant lounge parlor that operated through from New York City to Lake Placid and back the other way. So that's, that's the only reference I can see in any timetable for that kind of car. I, I couldn't tell you what it looks like. As far as the cars themselves and some numbers, uh, in 1940, New York Central rostered 157 active heavyweight diners. Um, you'll, if you look over here on this listing here, it says 1940, 171. I got that from uh, John Fowler's book. Uh, the difference there is some uh, maybe inactive stored serviceable cars, and, and in here, the difference between them is what? Uh, 15 cars, that includes the six Twin, twin unit cars that went with the 1930 century and the, the Mercury train had twin unit liners um, as well. But you can see that the numbers went up 1950, 191, although uh, Jeff Dowdy reports in one of his books that there were actually 240 cars that were rostered dining cars. This is full diners. The parenthesis on the right is kind of uh, half diner diner lounges that would be uh, added to the mix. So the only railroad in the country that had more full service diners in the central was the dreaded Penzi. And at the, at the peak they had 11 more than the central did, so not really that big of a deal, I guess. The Mercury. Interesting story. Uh, Richard Dreyfus, the designer, was commuting home out of Manhattan. And he went by Mount Haven Yard a number of times. And uh, he was in the process of being talked to by the New York Central for designs for the Commodore Vanderbilt and the Mercury locomotives and, and, and that sort of thing. And he noticed there was a whole string of cars that seemed to be sitting and never moved. And when he got into discussions with the Central, he asked what those cars were doing. He said, oh, they're commuter cars that we ordered in the 20s and with the downturn in the economy and the depression now, uh, we have no use for them. They're just, just sitting there. So, uh, 
when they talked about the cost of coming up with a uh, streamlined train, the Mercury, which was in three different sections of the Mercury, it ran uh, Chicago, Detroit, 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 Cleveland, and Cleveland, Cincinnati. Uh, the Central wanted to put get their toe in the water with streamlining. So when they talked to Dreyfus about this, the price tag that they, they came up with that the train sets needed for this was like, like staggering. So he brought up the commuter cars. He says, you've got these cars sitting there. He says, what's anything wrong with them? Mechanically? He says, no. Well, why don't we see what we can do with those cars? So they sent 30 some of these cars to Beach Grove and over the next year and a half, they converted them totally into what you see right here. Henry Dreyfus. Richard Dreyfus. I'm sorry, Henry. I, I, I gave you the wrong. <laughs> Henry Dreyfus. Right. I'm sorry. I knew when I said his first name. <laughs> this is a close up picture of the of, of the twin unit diner in, in later years. They were replaced in 1950, but they actually had them in service till 57. So the design worked pretty well. They had interesting vestibules on them. They actually had double uh, end doors on, on, on the end of these. So you could have was no two-way traffic in one door. You didn't need to, you need to have it. They were full full diaphragm, so you had the whole vestibule for people to pass through. Inside of one of the lounges, right there. So you saw the numbers of, of uh, diners that were on the roster, and see how it swelled up to a height around 1950. Uh, you wonder why the, the lightweight great, great steel fleet actually came into existence. And this, uh, considering that the, the Central ordered 746 cars really before the end of the war between Pullman Standard and Bud, and then when they finally got delivered to 47, 48, they had no idea what they were going to do with these things because the passenger traffic had, had dropped off even by that time. So. They had, they had surveyed people during the war and asked them what they would prefer in peacetime, how much travel they might do, what they would like. They want the old wooden interiors, uh, the more uh, modern interior, the light pastel colors and such. Um, the problem was only about 2,600 people ever responded to these surveys, and their marketing folks took this as their uh, reason to order uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment at the end of the war. And it's kind of hard to imagine, but uh, you know, that's the reality of it. So after the revenues had returned back to, to pretty good levels uh, during the war, uh, they thought that they were in good shape. The equipment was wore out some, some tears. I mean, the, the demands on the equipment and the people were, were tremendous during the war. So it wasn't a matter of fixing up the old stuff. They really thought it's best just to buy new because we're going to have this boom of peacetime travel and we need to be able to come back. So, um, after the 1938 uh, built new uh, for the, uh, the century uh, uh, diners, the next bunch came as, as four 40 seat diners for the Empire State Express. Uh, and that was really the end of anything new in the dining car world until after the war, when these big orders started coming in in 47, 48. And you can, you can read that right there. They split the orders between Bud and Pullman Standard. Bud got a little bit more. Uh, and the 463 is the one that's gone to the Adirondack in, in this case of Utica. So in 48, they also got twin unit diners. So it's either kitchen at one end of it, uh, a lounge at one end, or dorm at the, at the other end. All of those, like we're seeing right here, sat 48 people. In 1950, they, they did a strange thing. The CNO, after their failed Chessie launch, you know, the, the steam turbine deal and all this fancy thing, the fish bowls and all that kind of stuff, uh, CNO saw the writing on the wall and decided to cancel some orders, but the Central picked them up. And they got four of these uh, twin unit diners from CNO. Two went to the Illinois Central 56, and two went to the DNO, and you saw the picture inside of one uh, earlier. 
So uh, just as a matter of uh, wonder when these things happen, electric eye doors showed up in 48, and the first dishwashers, mechanical dishwashers, didn't show up until 51 on the central planners. So I'm sure the, the waiters thought that was a great thing when they got there. Both the electric eye and the, and the dishwasher. This is just the inside of tavern lounge cars uh, and such. Mm. Uh, at this point, when these were taken, uh, New York Central used Pullman for their lounges, buffets, and such. They did all, internally, did all their own dining car service. But Pullman was contracted to do the other beverage and food service that was lighter than, than the full diner until 58. In April of 58, the Central, with a cost-cutting measure, decided they're going to do all the sleeper uh, staffing and servicing and all the buffets and the lounges and the cafe cars themselves. Unfortunately for Pullman, Wabash and New Haven did the same thing almost at the same time. So, uh, it was a heck of a downturn in the economy in that year and precipitated that move. Uh, strange things that came about. The X, X train explorer and the aero train below. Pet projects of Robert Young, the fellow that came from the CNO, that had a proxy fight and took over the New York Central Board. Yeah, I believe it was in '54. Um, these were his uh, his pet projects. He thought he was going to. He was very pro passenger. He thought he was going to save rail passenger service by these things. Uh, the the aerotrain on the bottom was built by GM out of bus parts, really, kind of like a bus on rail. Uh, the Explorer. I can't remember who built that one. Both were fraught with mechanical issues, uh, rode terribly, they were, they were quite uh, rough, uh, rattled all over the place. So these were supposed to attract riders and they did nothing of the sort. Uh, within a, within a year they, they, were, they were gone. Uh, this was also the beginning of what the Central Cruise called the Cruise and Susan. These were parts that went down the aisle. Uh, they had flip down trays like Amtrak does today. So you didn't go to a dining car, they brought stuff to you. It wasn't a full, full meal. Uh, Pre-cooked meals actually showed up in 54 on 28 secondary train. The Central gave that a try. That was a total disaster. Less than a year after they started, they pulled that off. There's a public complaint. And as far as cheapening things, even the Empire State Express got paper placemats and napkins introduced in 53, and I don't think that lasted uh, all that long either. One other thing uh, that came up was like these automatic cars. These were actually, uh, Southern Pacific was the first, I believe, to come up with them in, in 59, and uh, Raytheon's radar oven, microwaves. Uh, that Southern Pacific pioneered that. So really what it was a vending machine that you bought a pre-cooked or needed to be cooked product at this vending machine, and it started with the lousy pictures. I got this offline, the only place you can find this. I found an article and I Googled it. So here's somebody stocking them from the back side, and here's someone on the front end selecting that. And the, and the, the microwaves, the radar ranges, were uh, right to the right there. So uh, this was supposed to really cut down the dining car <laughs> expense. It, it did it a little bit, but it really was not very popular. And uh, losses continued. At a high level uh, from dining car service. So those the uh, 39 and 40 were the two trains uh, tested in the daylight hours in, in 63. Not so sure how long that lasted. And then in 64 for the World's Fair Special uh, in, from Chicago to New York, they actually put two uh, modified coaches uh, on there or modified buffet lounges and called them automatic cars. So, what was famous on the menu on the New York Central? Well, these are the ones I picked out here from reading a whole bunch of different uh, dining on rail and God knows what else, uh, dining car books I have home. And you could argue that the time period would matter too. Because this is 1920s or 30s when menus were fancier and heavy with cream and uh, just uh, things that today we would think would be a heart attack on a plate. Uh, they didn't necessarily carry over into the 50s and 60s. They liked the same stuff, probably for uh, the 
cost of preparation of the case. But lobster Newburgh on toast and corn bread, at least in the later years on the, on the century, was a pretty big, big one. Uh, deep dish chicken pie was another one. You wouldn't think of it. Chicken pot pie. Was, I don't want to go like the central because I want a pot pie. But it was evidently very good. Royal sirloin steak with mushrooms shows up on all sorts of menus all over the place, from the century right down to anything that had a diner on it. Uh, the 20th century salad bowl was very, very famous. Uh, it had lots of different things, radishes, onions, tomatoes. Uh, it didn't have, I think it had French dressing on it. It wouldn't sound like something that you just like rule get on the train. It was uh, very famous. Their baked apple pie was really good. Some of it was green apple. A baked green apple pie was advertised as from just baked apple. Strawberry shortcake was another one, and wheat cakes for breakfast. Kind of like Santa Fe's French toast, wheat cakes on the central. Top on the list. So if you take a look here, this is from 1964. Uh, secondary trains, and if you look at the bottom here, you can tell it's that time because zip codes came out in 1963, and there's a zip code. 10017 for the dining car service manager in New York, talking about the World's Fair there. Uh, prices, pretty reasonable, to say the least. And a pretty good selection for a secondary train, I would think, this late in the game. The, um, from the 1965-66 uh, century menu, this is the, this is the front and the back cover of it. Front welcome you, the back cover would let you know if you were on time or not, or where, what time you should be ready to get off at your station. And then on the inside was your choices and so it's a little, a little bit of a step up from, uh, from the secondary trains, uh, but nowhere near as fancy as this was like 1938. Those menus would just like blow you away. Uh, you, you couldn't imagine they could keep supplies on hand to make that variety of uh, entrees and desserts and stuff. Yeah. Somebody have eat this seafood pie. 20th century. Actually, I just remembered a quote from uh, Lucius Beebe, who was uh, quite a critic. And, uh, wasn't necessary. He was very fond of century food, but he didn't think the rest of your central food was, was worth it. In Pennsylvania, he wouldn't even eat off of it. <laughs> <laughs> but he thought the B and O from soup to nuts was the rare. So. Anyway, uh, their deep dish uh, chicken pie. You never had peas in it. For some reason. Um, one thing you can pull off the bottom of these menus that's uh, kind of since the beginning of time. Please write on check each item desired. Waiters were not allowed to fill out your menu card for you or take verbal orders. You had to, I gave you pencils, you wrote them out, either the waiter picked it up or the steward would, would pick it up. And uh, you know, waiter cannot accept verbal orders. Uh, here we are, 19, this is 65, I think. Sugar substitute, so you get saccharin or something like that. American Express, remember rail, rail cards, uh, rail uh, the dip, uh, the diners express card, or one of those was actually first started because of the railroads, uh, dining car service back in the fifties. Uh, Here's uh, a service charge of fifty cents will be made for meals served outside the dining car. You can be served in your sleeping compartment. That's a for fifty cent charge. That, yes, if the, if the diner is busy, you probably have to stay hungry for just a little while longer. Uh, that man was uh, called, the, the waiter that took care of that was called the upstairs man or the swing man. It, uh, went and served uh, outside of the diner. Special menus for children, I got a picture of that. And if, uh, I guess that's, those are the take home things on that one. It's just something that was time honored for, for years on that. All railroads. Here's a picture of. Uh, I was going to bring this along. I've got a couple of these, and this. I don't know what era this was from, 
My guess is it's late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. 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 I ate off that menu. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> On a pass? You had, to, you had to pay for it, right? You had to pay for the food, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting things is what about the crews themselves? How did they work? How were they organized? Uh, Sheldon Lustig told me when I was out in Middleburg Heights in the archives uh, that he's pretty sharp about this. He worked for the Central. He worked in New York, Chicago. He did management stuff. Uh, not necessarily related to dining hall service, but uh, I, I put this by him. I said, you know, I've been looking at all sorts of books. I've asked Jeff Dowdy. I've asked other people. I said, where is all the stuff that you can find from Santa Fe, Southern Pacific, do you know, as far as the nitty gritty of how you operated a New York Central dining car? It doesn't exist. There's tons of pictures. We know about the menus. We know what you can drink. We knew the equipment. We knew all that kind of stuff. But we, there was there's no manual or anything that's ever been written about that says, this is how you do soup to nuts and use your manpower on the dining car. Uh, his response was, well, Charlie Smith, uh, last CMO for Central, was a pack rat or whatever, and when he died and we had to go out and get his stuff out in Massachusetts and Boston, he says the bank told us, the bank was a trustee or something, I can't remember, but they were in control of him. They gave him something like 48 hours notice to clean out his place. He had literally tons of things. Uh, Sheldon says, Charlie had cleaned out the dining car archives, and he probably was the sole person to possess all of the things that don't exist today. There was some of the stuff they were, didn't have time or the ability to save, and went out and do something like that. Probably lost forever. So, crew sizes, uh, on, and this is kind of uh, generalized in the, in the railroad world, that's just essential. Uh, depend on the type of car you use. Uh, diner lounges usually carry just four staff, whereas full diners anywhere from six to, six to ten, unless it was a duplex. Twin unit diner might have an extra steward and an extra leader uh, or two. Crew duties began at 4:30 because remember they had they had either press the logs or coal. I, I, I've not got a good answer for that. Whether the very central diners were all coal or they used press the logs. Press the logs. Oh, press the logs. Press the logs. Okay. Good. I've had people tell me both, and I've read both. So, uh, yeah, they couldn't use gas because in 1906 they had a train with gas cylinders blow up in a tunnel in New York, and New York City had an ordinance passed in that year that forbade any uh, contained gas, cylinder gas, to be transported in tunnels uh, in New York. So they couldn't do that. So start the stoves. And they didn't end until 10 o'clock or after. And uh, the century was unique in that uh, if it was 3 o'clock in the morning and a group of reveling people in the lounge or whatever decided that uh, they needed a cake, they could go and find someone in the dining car to actually bake them a cake or give them whatever they were looking for. That was company policy. It wasn't something written in the timetable or public, but uh, it was uh, unspoken. So dining car duties were really broad. Uh, these guys had to inventory and stock and clean and polish, and it was all under the supervision of the dining car steward. And uh, uh, so it was a pretty in intense sort of thing. These guys got paid pretty well, uh, especially after World War II. By the 1960s, the average dining car salary had quadrupled from what it had been in World War II. So, uh, and they worked, uh, they're guaranteed at first 240 hours uh, a month and then back down to 205. But so if they didn't get utilized for the whole thing, they didn't get paid by the hours they were working. They got paid on an agreed number of hours uh, per month. So, so you had a first cook. Second cook, third, fourth. I was like the fourth cook was unofficially known as the pearl diver or China clipper because he was the dishwasher. And pre dishwasher or mechanical dishwasher days, uh, that was a lot of uh, a lot of hands in the, in the hot water and such. 
these folks had to clean, collect linens, uh, inventory, cash balance. That was pretty much the, the dining car steward, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But one thing I don't know about Eric Central Diners is how they heated the hot water. Uh, they were going to say, yeah, it was steam heat. Yeah. But if you took some railroads like Canadian National, we have one of their diners, they had steam lances in the sink off the steam lines with a thermometer. So you got it up to the appropriate temperature to wash. Other railroads had heat exchangers. They had steam coils in a hot water tank. And I'm not so sure what the central had. I've never got into the engineering and you know, diagram of the cars uh, that heat. Anybody knows? I've been dying to know this for like 25 years. Jerry? Yeah. The last line there, the last two words. Yeah. Cash balances. Yes. Every time the steward departed from the car, the duty of inventorying the car. If it was in Buffalo, I fell to my father. He had a glass graduate cylinder. He got on the car and he had to inventory the entire bar. With alcohol. Yeah. yeah. And oftentimes while the car was being cleaned. And, and he wasn't drinking either. Just <laughs> Fascinating stuff. Well, we're going to hear more from Jim in a little bit about uh, those things. Uh, New York Central, like uh, most other major uh, passenger carriers, uh, had uh, pretty intensive training and uh, programs and held to high standards. Uh, employees in dining car service had to pass rigid physical uh, exams. They had they couldn't have any skin issues, particularly hands, clothes, you know, face, and that sort of thing. In the, in the old days, anyway, the the stewards would, would want to see dining car waiters' hands before they went on duty just to see that they were, they were clean. Uh, this is an interesting picture. Here's, here's one of these doors. Uh, this is on the century. I think this is the later years. These were double doors that opened up with the electric eye and such. So here was a good question, and I put this by Sheldon Lustig as well, since he seems to be a wealth of information. Where were the New York Central commissaries or stores for, for dining and lounge service and, and that sort of thing? Uh, it's easy to find Mott Haven in New York, in books and such, Root Street Yard in Chicago, and we know Buffalo Central Terminal, because we're close to that. We've got some of the audience here that was there when it was in operation. Uh, general consensus is that there were commissaries in Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, and Indianapolis. And that makes you wonder, well, what happened to St. Louis, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh? They were big, big terminals and such. Probably the fact that they were terminals meant that they could be stopped either at the, uh, at the beginning of a round trip or intermediate stop like Indianapolis. Uh, say going to St. Louis uh, and such. So those are the ones that are known about but there could be others. Again, with uh, Charlie Smith going to his grave and his collection of things going to the dumpster, we may not know that. So here's some pictures out of the New York Central Archives. This was on the, the cover of uh, issue that had a, a dining car uh, article by Jeff Dowdy over years ago, that's Root Street in Chicago. And up upper left is Mott Haven, uh, north side of Manhattan. And it's also Mott Haven with the turkeys down there, pre-Thanksgiving picture. Uh, one thing you've got to notice here, what do you see that's not over this guy's head? Any kind of covering. There's no covering. You do look at any railroad pictures of, of dining car servicing uh, and whatever. They rarely put any covering over this. Uh, Buffalo, uh, uh, how many terminating and originating dining cars could have been put over on that platform side, you know, the high-level platform that was close to where they could stock it? I don't know, but most of those uh, cars that were going through to Buffalo, uh, well, at least they could go down the platform, which was covered as well. But in the yards, there was very little protection uh, for car cleaners, for people stocking cars like this. Uh, pretty remarkable. Any time of the year, in any kind of weather. 
So the idea of costs comes into play because you know the demise of passenger service and the fact that dining cars were rarely uh, that service ever made any kind of money. So what kind of costs are we talking about? So I looked into some of this. In 1938, the Central paid about $92,000 for single single car diners, standalone, 36, 48 seat diners, and 48. The twin unit uh, diners were almost $200,000 a piece. Then you take a look at what they carry. Uh, I mean, there are hundreds of pieces of china, hundreds of pieces of silverware, and in the late 40s, they said that this equipment that they put on there was worth about 6500 bucks. I'll bet you you could take a bushel basket of that stuff today and sell it for 6500 bucks. But if you take a look at the inventory of things they have in these cars, uh, it was just this one. Just, I'll show you some pictures of silverware in the century pattern that's in the uh, Yale University collection of all places. Uh, breakage. Uh, Penzi claimed in, in the 1930s that up to 10% of glassware in China was broken on a monthly basis in these cars. Probably 5% uh, breakage, 5% like. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, especially smaller pieces. And the silver. Uh, dining car maintenance uh, in 1940 was estimated to be 7,000 a year. It doesn't sound like too much today, but I think you've got to multiply that by a few now. Uh, and post war uh, inflation really ate things up. By the 1948 uh, uh, overall labor costs on the central were up to, uh, up to 56% of revenue, and it was uh, worse than that on dining cars. So dining service was the most labor intensive of all of this operation, particularly related to passenger service. Um, flip these out of a couple of sources, scan them and put them in here. Uh, the chart on the left starts in 1948, goes to the end in 67, and shows you the number of passengers carried in the left column, and the passenger uh, miles uh, on the right. So you can kind of see this peak here. I mean, it, it was high certainly right after the war, but uh, it, it dropped and then it kind of leveled off a little bit. And it didn't do too badly here, and then by the late 50s, it really, really tailed off. If you look at the passenger deficit, which looks to start about 1955, that's up around, uh, uh, this is supposed to be a six up here. Oh no, that's supposed to be fifty. Maybe fifty-five. I'm not so sure. I didn't. I didn't draft that. I got confident on something. But you're looking at over fifty million dollars. They whittled it down uh, in the late fifties, but it never did drop below twenty million dollars, even with the cutting all sorts of services and, and trains, uh, passenger train revenues. And this is all. Uh, this is inner city. This isn't commuter. Uh, put into the mix here. But you can look at the revenues drop uh, as well. So uh, this was the Mercury pattern. Uh, China and uh, Henry Dreyfus designed both of these. He was uh, he was quite the guy and such. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit about the the, the silver here. Uh, all of these items were designed by Dreyfus. Uh, this. Most of this stuff, almost all of this stuff, was designed for the Mercury trains in 1935-36. Uh, this was all carried over for the Century pattern. It, uh, it didn't become known as the piece of flatware and the hollowware. It wasn't the uh, it wasn't the Mercury pattern. It became the Century pattern that stayed that way. The vases didn't change from start to finish. Then you can notice. This is a typical century pattern here on that uh, looks like a wine cooler. There. Uh, just a shot, uh, one on the left is an old picture of century table setting. Uh, the one on the right is from John Fowler's personal collection that uh, is in his book, nice stuff. I don't collect much china, but I imagine that charger there on the right was worth a few dollars. 
So here's a picture. This came from Yale University's uh, art gallery. It has a collection of century uh, New York Central flatware and hollowware, evidently. And it just shows you it's back stamped <coughs> at the bottom, the upper part of the handles. 11 pieces here. And I know that I think I've got 12 in my collection. I don't have too many of them. But that, those are the common ones. Where do you see the stuff that's in the Yale or out of a catalog? This is all part of stuff designed by Dreyfus. I don't know how much of this actually saw service. And this is one, one slide of this. This is another slide. Look at all this stuff. There's more of it. You know, it, it this is the, the century menu holder here. You've got uh, for uh, kind of a thermos, water, or it could be coffee as well. Uh, tip, tip tray, uh, serving trays, crummer, you know, that sort of Some of the stuff you know, you've probably seen around, a lot of these things are pretty unusual. All righty, I'm going to stop here. Anybody have any questions? Not that I'm a great expert on all this stuff, but I could. I could lie a little bit if you want me to try. <laughs> <laughs> You're either all asleep or dead enough. All right. Good. Well, uh, Jim is at a loss here because I was going to show him these next two slides, but he go, I could put them up here. Uh, I put these together because I had communication with him in person on the phone about his dad's uh, work with the New York Central that uh, fits right in with this. So I'm going to put it to the next slide and I'm going to leave it up to you. and. Uh, Take it from here. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Right off the top. Um, yep. Work any hour of the day or night. Uh, my, in my remembrance, because I'm the youngest, uh, I was born in 1947, and I have an older brother uh, who is nine and a half years older than I am. And so, about the time. When he was 18 and was gone, went to work for the Central in the wire chief's office. Um, in those days, we had a 55 Ford, which was not new, so it would be about 1958, 59, uh, was when I got to know the terminal and the railroad a little bit better. Um, because Dad worked Wednesday, you know, every day but Wednesday and Thursday, including Christmas Day and uh, Thanksgiving, um, my brother worked a standard. You know what we would think of Monday through Friday in the uh, wire chief's office as a messenger. Um, he would get up Saturday morning and take Dad to work, so that the only car in the family, <clears throat> excuse me, could be available for Mom to go shopping. And um, of course, when he would get in the car to go down at 5:30 to go pick up Dad, uh, I was the wingman. So that was my introduction to Central Terminal and the inner workings and all of the interesting things that went on in there behind the scenes. Um, if you stop and think about this, you know, the railroad sits there in their high and mighty ivory tower and says, okay, this is going to be the menu for the train on um, this time period. Uh, in Cleveland, in Buffalo, in New York City, you will put this food on the train. So those orders would come down from New York and then it would fall to my father to either inventory or draw from inventory, you know, the mustard, the ketchup, the relish, the pickles, the pancake syrup, the, you know, all the stuff that you would normally have in dry good storage in the building already. And then meat, fish, poultry would be bought on the day for the car, delivered to the terminal and put onto the diner that day. And that was what, you know, if, you, if those of you remember the little article I wrote in the Empire State Express um, about the steer that escaped from the stockyard and wandered into the terminal. What Dad was doing when that thing came down the aisle was ordering. He was doing his daily orders. Um, I can remember at Christmas time the, uh, the wallet came from the George Colesman Fish Company and the uh, little crock of cheese that came from the cheese supplier. But, you know, um, if it was anything that was fresh, it had a, a limited time frame for using it, it had to be bought to the menu on the day or the day before 
so that it could be loaded onto the diner for it to go out in the train. And, you know, because everybody who worked in the dining car service, you know, did this on a daily basis, everybody knew what was going on. So everybody kind of, you know, worked ahead a little bit or whatever they needed to do. Throw a monkey wrench into that. Somewhere down the line on the way into Buffalo, from either direction, you do an emergency stop. Okay, engineer dumps the air, your 15 car train locks up every wheel, and it slides for, I don't know what, mile before it comes to a stop. Now you pull into Buffalo and the diner that's in the train is doing what? Mm-hmm. I remember the phone call. Um, telephone would ring. Dad was always home for dinner about six o'clock. Uh, phone would ring. My mother would come <clears throat> stomping back into the kitchen, rumble, rumble, rumble. Empire came in with flat wheels. Dad won't be home till nine o'clock. And what that meant was he had to take the dining car that he had spent all afternoon preparing for the night train and stick it into the train that came in with the flat wheels and then get another diner from the yard and start the process all over again before you go home. Completely restock another diner before you go home. And it was a common enough occurrence that everybody knew what she was talking about. And she came stomping back in the kitchen. So anyway, um, all of the material that went into cooking, and think about this, if you were stocking, uh, to go on a picnic, you know, the salt, the pepper, the ketchup, the sugar, all of that stuff had to be put onto the car. Everything had to be checked. All of the food had to be put away on the car so that when the cooks were ready to cook, they had it in a place. Uh, that which needed to be refrigerated was refrigerated. That which needed to be, you know, heated could be heated. And yes, they did use, as we said, the uh, pressed sawdust logs that they call crustal logs. Um, somewhere along the line, I think probably at the end of the days of the dining cars, one of them came home and it was in the basement. I don't know what dad had in mind for it, but I played with it for a long time until it finally disintegrated. But they were just, you know, two, three inches a day. Remember? How does that work All of the suppliers that dealt with the railroad were on 24 hour a day call. You know, the Bolsma Fish Company, uh, you know, all the other people who supplied them. Uh, they were, you know, it was a 24 hour operation all the time. Um, so, okay. There was a gentleman whose job it was to purchase, you know, bulk items for the railroad, purchasing agent somewhere. And maple syrup is a seasonal item, you know, and the amount of maple syrup that the Central purchased was incredible because of the number of meals that they served over the entire system. Um, This man would put out an ad or in letter form to all of the farmers in Western New York who would produce maple syrup. And he would advertise for sample and for how much can you produce. And then all of those samples would come into his office to be tested. And all of those who passed muster would then get a purchase order from the railroad. And all of that came into Buffalo. And it was dispersed to Cleveland and New York and some other places from Buffalo. All of the Vermont maple syrup and from Western New York. <laughs> still does. And it still does. Um, there's a lot of um, things that I didn't know about what went on down there because I was only 10, 11, 12 years old at, you know, during that time period uh, when I was getting to know the business. Uh, my father worked for the Central for 38 years. He started in the original commissary, which was on Green Street. And they moved into Central Terminal from Green Street when it was opened in 1929. Um, there was, you know, the issue of linens. 
all the tablecloths and the napkins and the towels and all of that stuff that had to be washed every time the car came in. It had to be cleaned. All of that stuff had to be moved. It had to be transported to the laundry, cleaned, and then come back. And of course, that trip back and forth from the laundry was fraught with all kinds of things going missing. Um, okay. <coughs> There we go. Yeah. White Horse Whiskey and National Brand Beer. Um, in, the, uh, in the bar car, you had, of course, the, uh, the common things, the Budweiser and the, uh, the Canadian Club and what have you. But uh, I still have somewhere uh, one of the wooden boxes that the whiskey bottles came in. And it was White Horse. And they were all in wooden boxes. And there were no cardboard in those days. Um, I have on the shelf single cup and two cup standard Syracuse China teapots, which my mother used on a regular basis. They do not have the New York Central name on them, but they are in New York Central gray. If you put it down next to one that was in someone's collection, probably out of Doug McIntyre's book, it's identical. But none of the numbered trains wound up with the company name China on them. It all had the standard catalog Syracuse or Buffalo China on it. In fact, one of the plates, the sandwich plate, um, I've forgotten what the pattern is. It's, um, it's probably so big and uh, it's got a white design on it. My mother used to tease me when I came home for lunch from school. It's the blue plate special. Um, the same plate appears in Doug McIntyre's book, and on the back is the New York Central label. The one that we have doesn't, because it was the common, everyday, numbered train China. Um, oh yeah, my father, of course, went to work early in the morning, um, commuting in his first car he had after the war was a 47 Ford turtleback. And, uh, that took him to work many, many years, and he would go into the employee parking lot, in which he had his little red oval sticker for the New York Central employee, allowing him to park in the employee lot. And he would get onto the train and go into the kitchen, and of course everybody knew him, and he would get his breakfast on the train, out of the diner. And uh, if he didn't get off quickly enough, he would have wound up in Westfield, because that was the next stop. And it was more than once he said he got off the train after it started moving. But in those days, you didn't worry about those kinds of things. But uh, of course, the infamous runaway steer story uh, has been in print already. And uh, the watch your step pigtail <laughs> uh, inventorying the cars at night. Of course, in the, between the terminal and Bailey Avenue, they were continually moving equipment back and forth. Uh, sorting the trains out, putting them back together in the right order. Uh, he learned early on to take a flashlight with him and to stop before he got down off the legs, step of the car and push the flashlight down at the ground. Because one night as he was about to step down, something told him to wait. He looked down, there his flashlight on it. He couldn't figure out what he was looking at. It looked like someone had rolled up a piece of carpet and left it laying there. Well, when the piece of carpet snorted and walked away, he was really, really happy that he didn't step in the middle of its back. Of course, the 26 tracks adjacent to Central Terminal, the far side of those on the southeast side was the Buffalo Stockyards. And all kinds of things uh, wandered away. So, um, there's probably a whole bunch more stories, uh, some of which are not germane to the railroad, but um, as we go along down the road, if I can conjure up enough detail to make it worth writing down, maybe we'll publish them in the Empire State Express, and Jerry can add them to his <coughs> tales of the dining car service. Anything else I can do for you while I'm standing here? Yes, I folks have any questions or This 
this is uh, 19, March 1951. Yeah, my father worked in the dining car department right up until they closed it. Uh, he was six years short of retirement, and uh, the railroading and their generosity said to him, um, well, we have to give, either give you severance pay or offer you another job, so you can have the same job at the same pay in Grand Central in New York City which was not a practical thing. Both my brother and sister were in college at the time and I was still in high school. So uh, he turned it down. He went to work for M&T Bank for the final six years of his working career. But uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating place um, even now. But if, if you could only have written down all the stories of all the things that happened during the everyday working of the place, it was incredible. Jerry, appreciate you coming in and doing this for us. Um, okay. If anybody has any comments on any of this, like what uh, what fiction did he grab that information from? Let me know. I mean, I, I just <laughs> get what I read in some publications sometimes. Or, uh, a little bit flawed, and whatever. If anybody had, had somebody had something to add to this, I'd love to hear. If you think about it, let let Jim know. And I just want to say one thing. Um, I can do this without getting too much of my shadow in here. The infamous lightning strike paint job. I accepted that without question for most of the time that I was a, a rail fan of growing up. Um, digging into the New York Central's mindset of how they went to market with their transportation system. If you look at the color that they painted the locomotives and those stripes, that's a business suit. I think very much that was their intent. Of course, we rail fans have our own way of dealing with things and how we describe it. But um, they published things in their marketing that were intended for you know, the traveling businessman. And to my mind, I can see where that where they were coming from with that paint scheme. But that was intended. Yeah, that it was intended to be a, a, a pinstripes businessman suit. So, and that's just my humble opinion. And you can agree with it or not. Go. So, uh, on that basis, let me thank. Not only Jerry for coming, but Bruce for his efforts here today, Greg for setting up the uh, equipment, Nancy and Becky for their work in putting this together, especially Nancy and her crew over there, uh, her wingman Bob, and uh, MJ and Peggy for doing the running, and Becky, and who am I missing? I thought I had these all in my head and I've been missing somebody, I'm sorry. On that basis, I will sit down and take your shoe off. <laughs> The chapter archives contain hundreds of hours of historic rail and trolley films and videos. Preserving and digitizing and making these films available to the public is a prime goal of the chapter, but requires significant financial resources. Please consider making a donation in support of this ongoing effort today. Please visit www.nfcnrhs.org to learn more and to make a generous contribution. Remember that Niagara Frontier Chapter NRHS Incorporated is an IRS recognized 501c3 educational nonprofit organization. Donations may be tax deductible. Please consult your tax advisor. <laughs>